My first guest tonight is uh, rather a phenomenon on the political scene as a, a citizen politician making his first try for public office. He was elected California's 33rd governor in 1966 by a majority of something around over a million votes. And he held that office, you know, for eight years. And he used to joke that in his earlier profession, he used to write off in the sunset with the words, the end on his back. But there are those who would say that Ronald Reagan, the 1975 may only be the beginning. Would you welcome, please, the former governor of California, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to be here, John. And nice of you to have me here after, oh, a little more than two months unemployment. That's right. Uh, how does it feel to be, uh, well, you're not really unemployed now because I know you're doing a syndicated column and um, for many news, there are around 120 papers, I think, and a radio show and uh, on the lecture tour, but how does it feel to be, I don't know if they use the word temporarily out of politics or not, but we'll get into that later. Uh, how does it feel to be away from Sacramento? Well, it's uh, doing what I'm doing. I've wanted to for a long time. It's very exciting. And um, uh, there's mixed emotions when you step down. There's always things that you had left undone that you'd like to have done, but then uh, all of a sudden the curtain's pulled and that chapter's over and... Uh, Somebody else takes over? Yeah. What, did you have any major disappointments? What would you have liked to have done or your biggest disappointment and maybe your biggest highlight in office as you look back on it? Well, uh, I'll start with the biggest highlight. The uh, First of all was proving that some things I'd long believed as a citizen would work, that you could introduce common sense in government and after the first traumatic shock, uh, you kind of made some of it work. We, um, we came into quite a, a mess, and at the end of eight years, uh, you know, government in the United States, federal, state, and local, has been growing for 20 years in size about two and a half times as fast as the increase in population, except for the last eight years in California. We turned over a government that was the same size as the one we inherited eight years ago. There had been no growth. And uh, in some departments, this meant an increase of as much as 66% in the workload. Mm -hmm. But um, part of that was the welfare reforms. Right. Uh, welfare was increasing here in California, 40,000 cases a month. And uh, we left with about 400,000 fewer people on welfare than there were four years ago. This saved the taxpayers about a billion dollars, but what was equally important we were spread so thin we couldn't do what we should have done for uh, the really needy, the really deserving. Right. And we were able to increase their grants by way of those reforms 43%. Right. Now, you asked for what was the greatest disappointment. Uh, the people handed it to us when I think they were deceived, but when they voted down the tax limitation plan. I still say that the answer to our problems in this country, even at the national level, is to have a law that says there is a percentage limit of the people's earnings that government cannot go beyond without the consent of the people. <laughs> you're, talking about, well, you're talking about the gross income of the country and how much they can appropriate for, uh, That's right. for federal projects. See, when, uh, when you and I were boys back in the Midwest, right. governments, federal, state, and local, were only taking about 15 cents out of every dollar earned. Today, they're taking almost half of every dollar earned in the United States. And most people don't realize it because the taxes are hidden in the so-called business taxes. You know, the politician that stands up and yells, oh, let's save the little man, let's tax business, and everybody mm -hmm. yells, hooray. But they haven't figured out that every tax on business is just a part of the cost of production. And the customer winds up paying it when he buys the product. It's a hidden sales tax. There's 116 of them in our the suit of clothes that each one of us is, is that wearing. Right? Suppose a lot of uh, economists have suggested, and I don't know that it'll ever come to be in this country, that they're, if they closed all of the loopholes and uh, corporations and maybe tax loopholes and even on the rich certain loopholes and, and made a percentage income and made a flat fee without all of the deductions, that the government might raise as much money as they do now. Oh, sure. And really, the loopholes, this has been overdone by the politicians, too. No. The bulk of the money that is taken by what are called loopholes are the legitimate deductions with which if the people didn't have them, they couldn't pay their income tax. Interest on their mortgage, right. uh, interest on the installments on their, on their car, their property taxes on their home if they have one and right. so forth. These are, in politicians' eyes, loopholes. But 
we ought to have tax reform, and we ought to start by making it so simple that you don't have to hire a lawyer to find out how much you owe every year. That's for sure. It used to be, uh, it used to be a little simplified, but not anymore. We, we, Johnny, we live in the only country in the world where it takes more brains to figure out your income tax than it does to earn the income. <laughs> you might be right. Why, why do you think people are so, they seem to be so disheartened now? I, I know, the, let's don't get into the Watergate thing, but that certainly had something to do with the, uh, the antipathy, I think, of a lot of people toward government. Now we, we see these revelations, or whether they're revelations or at least accusations that possibly the CIA has been involved in some operations that they shouldn't have been involved in, certainly domestically, and people regularly get turned off. How do you, how do you turn people around and say, all right, now, we're not going to do this anymore, and every day you see more of these things, and I think people withdraw further and further, and, and that's too bad. I know, and I think part of it is because we're being bludgeoned every day. It's news. Bad things are news. Uh, we just, uh, every day we pick up and they read a, record another tenth of a percent unemployment and so forth. Uh, we keep hearing the, the bad things. We hear the accusations, and we're kind of used to accepting the accusation as proof of guilt. Uh, now, I'm on the CIA commission, so I'm rather limited. I cannot talk at oh, this stage. That's true. But I think one of the sad things is that the American people cannot know instead, frankly, we have to have a counterintelligence organization for our own safety. If the American people knew the extent to which we're being spied on by the Russians, uh, they'd throw detente out the window and Brezhnev and a few fellows with it. Well, obviously, uh, I agree that that has to go on internationally to protect your national security, but when they start looking at you know, their, their own congressmen and own private citizens whose who's only uh, threat to national security seem to be to voice some difference of opinions. That's going a little over the well, line, isn't it? No, uh, because, well, again, as I say, we, oh, you're the that's right. you we, can't, can't, uh, we can't give any progress reports. You want to speak into the ashtray here and tell me privately? Uh, all I'd say to the people is wait until the report comes in. And I think when a report comes in, uh, um, uh, maybe they might be greatly reassured. Yeah. I didn't mean to put you behind the eight ball there. I realize, of course, you're on that commission and you couldn't expand on that. Let's take a brief break and we'll, we'll come right back and get on another subject. Sure.